Good morning, this is Pastor Marvin Osmore, the First Baptist Church of Birmingham, Ohio, and I hope you're well today. We're continuing our study on the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, which is many uh, declare as Jesus' greatest sermon, certainly the greatest sermon this world has ever heard, uh, given by Jesus Christ himself. Now we're going to a very difficult passage, I think, to interpret in our day and age. And that has to deal with the Mosaic Law. And we'll get into our passage and we'll kind of give you a brief, brief synopsis of how important the Mosaic Law was to, uh, to, to Israel's um, entire system, socially, um, legally, um, uh, spiritually, and so forth. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 7 through, uh, 17 through 20. And so, when we think about the Mosaic Law, we may, may think, go back all the way to the Ten Commandments. But there were hundreds of, of laws given through uh, the, the uh, Pentateuch, or the um, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Certainly the Ten are what we know, but there were some that sprung off of that, and it dealt, dealt with uh, various aspects of the, um, the, the, the whole life of the Jewish believer, their worship system, uh, their dietary system, and so forth. So it's important that you and I understand how important the law was. So if they thought that Jesus was coming to, uh, to destroy the law, basically they thought that Jesus was coming and teaching uh, a destruction of the whole uh, life of the uh, of a typical Jewish person there, and certainly that would really um, not only disrupt the ordinary Jewish person, but also all those who were in authority, spiritual authority. And so you think of this guy who comes in; he's teaching something different. They believe from the Mosaic Law, and and now they see him as a threat. Now they want to get rid of him, and so Jesus addresses that doesn't he he addresses that he's not come to uh to destroy it but to fulfill it you think about all the billions of people who walked this planet before jesus came not one was able to fulfill it but only one uh before jesus came and after jesus came was able to fulfill completely all the law and so uh what is the purpose of the law it certainly it reveals uh the holy character in the eternal nature of Almighty God. And so we see that in Leviticus 19, 20, or 19 verse 2, I'm sorry, and 20 verse 7 and 8. It sets the nation of Israel apart from all the other nations around them. And so it, they're different. Remember when the Bible says in the New Testament we're supposed to come out from among them and be ye separate? Well, uh, that's certainly the Mosaic Law separated them they weren't doing. Uh, they weren't supposed to be participating in the uh, the sexual lasciviousness of the of the surrounding nations. They were supposed to honor God, and worship God only, and not Baal or uh, Ashtar or anything else. And we find that in Exodus nineteen verse five. It certainly revealed the sinfulness of man. We see that in Galatians chapter three nineteen. Uh, that's why Romans seven twelve said calls it the law good. And holy, because it, it set up not only set God's who God is, but also reveals who we are. See, when we look into the law, or the you know Ten Commandments and the other ones, there we we it should it should be a mirror that reveals that 
I'm incapable of, of complying with all this. I'm going to break it. As James says, if we break one portion of the law, we've broken the whole thing. And so, um, which led to the other one in Leviticus, Leviticus 1 through 7, it provided forgiveness uh, through the sacrifices or temporary forgiveness through the sacrifices and certainly pointed to the to the the eternal atonement found through Jesus Christ our Lord hundreds of years later. And so we what we do know is that Jesus Christ did come and fulfill the law uh, that through his death on the cross, uh, we are delivered from the bondage of the law forever. Romans 7, 4 through uh, 6, Romans 10, uh, 1 through 11, Galatians 5, 18, 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 11, Hebrews 7, 11 through 28. In other words, it's repeated over and over again so that the Jewish peoples would understand that Jesus came to fulfill the law. To And then remember that in the in the epistles that, that people would kind of crept into the those uh, the churches and it began saying you needed to be saved and to uh, uh, keep the law uh, and Paul uh, overtly and and and, and strongly uh, rebukes their uh, their heresy there because in order to keep the law you're actually denying the grace of God for by grace he is saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, uh, and so we're going to address a little bit of that today as well. And uh, so uh, just a brief, how important the, the, the New Testament, I mean, the Old Testament law was. It was everything to the Jewish person. And so if you were seen as a threat to the way of life of the Jew, uh, you had to be uh, you had to be eliminated. You need to get rid of them. And that's exactly what they sought to do. So here we are. We're addressing uh, Matthew chapter 5. And he's saying Jesus comes out and he says, I'm not come to destroy the law or the prophets. And uh, there, we just talked about why uh, he had to address that right off the bat. Don't think I'm I'm come to uh, to take away from that. I've come to fulfill it. You've been able, you've had thousands of years now to look at the law and realize that you are incapable of doing it. Now look to me because I am fulfilling the law right now. And certainly he would fulfill it on the cross of Jesus Christ. And uh, so he says, I'm not come to destroy the law or the prophets. He goes on to say, I'm, um, uh, I'm sorry, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Uh, he's saying that, you know what, I, I hold the scripture in the highest regard. And uh, as a matter of fact, if we look in John chapter 1, he's, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so for him to deny the law or deny uh, what was written in the Old Testament was to deny himself because he is the embodiment of the Word of God himself. He is, according to John chapter 1, that he is the Word. And so he says, I've not come to take away. We know, the Bible tells us that God cannot lie. And uh, so whatever God says, he, he, he means and he means what he says. And and uh, he says, I'm not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. God laid the plan out. He revealed his righteousness. He understood, the, and, and it revealed to the Jewish peoples that unless they were uh, had the righteousness of God in their life, they were not going to see him. They weren't going to see God. And that's why the the initiation of the temporary sacrifices of the, of the lambs and the rams and the bulls and so forth, which covered their sins, temporarily, which pointed to the uh, the ultimate, the spotless lamb of God on the cross. And so he says, I've not come to destroy the law of the prophets, because I tell you that, that every dot and every T will be crossed. Everything that God says will be fulfilled. You know, God says what he means, and he means what he says. He says, I'm not coming to destroy that. I've come to fulfill it for the first time uh, out of the billions of people that have walked this planet, 
I am the one, the only one, who is qualified to fulfill the law. Not one person. You think of David, you think of Daniel, you think of, of Joseph, you think of, of Hannah, you think of, of uh, Rebecca, you think of all these great saints of old, and all the, the prophets, and you think of all the saints uh, that have, since, the, uh, since uh, Christ came to earth, they were incapable, I'm incapable, you're incapable of keeping the law entire. Jesus did for us what we were incapable of doing. He did what was the impossible, and that's he fulfilled the law of God because he was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he did what he, he, he set out to do, to fulfill the Word of God. How important is the Word of God? Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Uh, Psalms 12, 6 through 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalms 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What God says he means and what he means he says, and you can count on that promise. That's why we live in the most exciting time in the history of the world because all those prophecies, those end time prophecies, we're seeing fulfilled right before our eyes. And and, uh, so we need to know the word of God or we're going to be swept away by all this other nonsense that is being taught, this tolerance, this acceptance, this gay marriage, and so forth. And that's not uh, what the Word of God says. People say, well, that was that was then, this is now, we've misinterpreted. No, we haven't. What we have in the Bible is what God wants us to have. And so he says, I've not come to destroy it, but to fulfill the law. And uh, he goes on to say that, whosoever therefore shall break one of these uh, one of these least commandments and shall teach men so how, so shall he be called the least in the kingdom of heaven and so how important is the word of god number 1 christ said he's he's come to fulfill it number 2 he says even every dot uh, uh, above an i and every cross of a t every jot and tittle the littlest marks in the uh, in the Hebrews, uh, when, when transcribing, would be fulfilled. He goes on to give out a warning. He's given a warning, these false teachers, these ones who know the truth and refuse to reveal the truth because somehow they are profiting from it or they are uh, it, it threatens their way of life, their livelihood or whatever else. They're manipulating the scriptures to to satisfy their own personal needs. He says, Wherefore, therefore, shall break one, uh, whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, some say that this is talking about teachers who are saved and are teaching a false doctrine. I'm not sure. I kind of think that he's addressing those false teachers that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, may or may not be saved who are teaching wrongfully. And so how important is the Word of God? It is important that you're in a church that teaches the Word of God, who preaches the Word of God, regardless of what society says. You don't want a church that sways with the with the norms of society. The norms of society changes, but the Word of God stands true. You want a man who gets in the pulpit and preaches the Word of God, whether people in the church like it or not, or whether the world likes it or not, Thus saith the Lord. And so the warning here that the word of God is so important. Jesus didn't come to to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Every little item in the law will be fulfilled. And those who teach contrary to that will be judged. Will be judged. And there's also a reward. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. And so there's a warning to those who who teach falsely, but there's also a reward. Remember, Paul said that we are to be instant in season and out of season. We're supposed to preach the word of God whether people like it or they don't like it. And there's reward here. He says, not only those who 
who do and teach. That idea of that the pastor is not above what the Word of God says, and neither are you. That we are to teach it, and, and we're all to live it. He says, great is the reward. You'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you have a, a presence in, in, in heaven. Those people who preach the Word of God will be rewarded, I think, here on earth. Maybe not materially, but we're certainly rewarded here on earth. And... Um, but we're going to be rewarded when we get to heaven. How important is the word of God? Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. Number two, I'm not one thing that, that, uh, that God put in the Old Testament or in the New Testament will fall away, but every dot and every cross of the T will be fulfilled. Every jot and tittle will be fulfilled. Those who refuse to teach the word of God will be judged. And those who do teach, rightfully teach the word of God will be rewarded. And so, we look in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we were allowed to, of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the hearts. We're not to be men pleasers. We're to be God pleasers. We answer to an audience of one, as someone rightfully said. We have to please God, whether people in the church agree with it or not. I remember one time, some dear old saint uh, trying to get me to comply with what this group of people had come to confront me on. And they said, remember, you work for us. And I looked at her and said, I don't work for you at all. I work for the Lord. I said, I had a job before I came in here, and I have a job after I, if I ever am called away from here. But I've never worried about that. And so I'm going to continue to do what I do. And, uh, you know, that old saint is... is is not in this church anymore, but I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm preaching the Word of God, and, uh, and I'm doing what I think God wants me to do. And I'm, I'm not perfect in any way, and, and certainly I can be a better teacher than I am right now, but um, my honestly in in honesty and integrity when dealing with the Word of God is intact. And, um, and so I hope that I am considered great in the kingdom of God. First Thessalonians 2 9 says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for our laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of Christ. That's the goal, right? To continue to teach. So you, as a believer, grow in your in your faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and you become and actively involved in your church and and reach people for Jesus Christ and and certainly through these videos that people get saved. For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so certainly, as he was talking about those who 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 de declared that they know the scriptures and refuse to teach the scriptures, refuse to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds those. Now, what's he saying here about the exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Well, the scribes and Pharisees thought by their works that they were able to earn the righteousness of God. They were they refused to look in the scripture and see and see where they were falling short and repent of that sin. Rather, they thought that somehow on the great scales of of God that that their good works were going to outweigh their bad works, that their 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 ability to keep the law will outweigh those things that they were un, not able to keep and they would somehow enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is rebuking that right from the get-go. He says, I'm not come to destroy the Mosaic law. I've come to fulfill the law. And the purpose of the law is to show your sinfulness, to show the righteous requirement of God and how you are unrighteous and you need to uh, to repent of your sins, uh, give those sacrifices, and certainly ultimately uh, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the, the propitiation for our sin, our atonement on that cross who covers our sins once and for all. For I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember Jesus said that warning uh, in that day, uh, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not? 
and they're, t they're going to go through their spiritual resumes and they've done exorcisms and they've given their sacrifices and they've done this and that. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. In other words, they were trying to get there on their own. The purpose of the law is to reveal that you and I can't get there on our own. We need God's grace in our life. We need it. And uh, if you've not repented of your sins, you need to repent of your sins. You're not good enough. You haven't done enough. You're, you're, you're incapable of being good enough. You're incapable of doing enough in order to earn God's favor. Jesus did for us what we were incapable of doing. That's why John 3.16 is so powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that passage goes on to say that those who, believe, uh, who, who refuse to believe him are condemned already. And so he's talking to the Jewish peoples who thought that somehow righteousness was found uh, through keeping the law, that now that they, if they honestly looked into the, into the Mosaic law, that they would see their sinfulness, see that they're incapable of doing that, and now they would look to Jesus Christ the only begotten son who came to earth, who fulfilled the entire law, laid down his life and became the, the sacrifice for all who put their faith and trust in him. That is the profound truth of, of what Jesus is saying here in this passage. This is a difficult passage for us because we're so far removed from that, um, that system there that we're, we don't live our lives under that under that, you know, that, that system there that really uh, dictated their entire life. And uh, uh, Romans 10, 2 through 4 says, For I bear them record that they may have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. If you want to be righteous, he says, look to the one who fulfilled the law, who kept all those, um, all those commands perfectly. He didn't sin once in word, in thought, in deed, his evil, no, no evil intents, nothing. He says, look to Jesus who is the end of the law. And so, you and I have an opportunity today. Maybe you've lived your life um, trying to be good enough, trying to do enough, trying to go to church enough, trying to uh, read your Bible enough, hoping that somehow you would earn God's favor. Maybe you go to the Catholic Church, or you go to the Pentecostal Church, or you go to the uh, Mormon church, or you go to whatever church out there, and and you know that you know that you know you're not saved. There's that doubt in your heart. Let's put an end to that today. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Look to the one who died on the cross for your sins. He and he alone is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfilled the law. He did for us. We were incapable of doing. He covered our sins if we put our faith and trust in him? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Why don't you say, dear God, please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and save me now and save me forever. Make me eternally yours. I receive Jesus Christ as my savior. Thank you for dying on that cross. Thank you for fulfilling the law. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Difficult passage. Hard to summarize in just 20, less than 25 minutes. But we did our best. And I encourage you, if you want to know more, study more. Go back and look over this passage. This is Pastor Marvin Osborne saying God loves you and I love you as well. And I'll talk to you soon.